Welcome to our captivating journey as we dive deep into mystery, facts, and secrets. Prepare for an exciting ride filled with heartwarming stories, mind-boggling experiences, and profound revelations. Take a moment to unwind and embark on this adventure with us as we talk about the latest and best for this week. Remember to show your support by hitting that like button and subscribing to our channel. People who met their crushes years later, how did it turn out? Viewers edition. Story 1. I'm late to the party, but here it goes. In sixth grade, a girl, let's call her Anna, got transferred to my class, and at least for me, it was that love at first sight type of deal. She went to the free spot right in front of me, and me being socially awkward, I didn't even try to talk to her at first. Until she started talking to me, asking some stuff about the classes and some stuff here and there. In middle of the second or third period, she asked if she could draw on my notebook, one of the examples our teacher gave us, since I mentioned to her earlier that I always liked to draw stuff, but still was quite bad at it. Then she took my notebook and went on drawing. A friend of mine just called me and gave me a WTF look when she did that. I just shrugged and continued the class. On the second day, she gave me her number, and we went on talking every day. It just clicked. And at the time, I didn't notice how or why, how stupid I was. We'd talk every day about almost literally everything. She'd tell her problems, vent to me, ask stuff about our classes, and vice versa. Some time goes by, and we are considered our class couple, and we were like that until the end of the 8th. We've gotten really close in those years to a point where I didn't know if she was just being nice to me since my class would hate me for no apparent reason whatsoever, or if she really liked me. At the end of 8th grade, my parents were looking into another school to enroll me for some reason I'd like to not share, and I told her that. When I did, she just said, oh, okay, and something along those lines, and our conversation ends. And I went on doing my homework for around 30 minutes, and a really close friend of hers messaged me asking what I did to her. I didn't understand what she meant by that, and asked her what's happening. She then said that Anna was crying because of something I said to her. I then explained to her what happened, and she tried to pull a wingwoman for me and Anna. I went to talk to Anna sometime after that. She was crying, saying that she really liked me as well, that she'd miss me, all that stuff. At the time, I didn't notice how much I meant to her. At the beginning of ninth, since my new school was relatively close to my old one, I messaged Anna about meeting her someday. That would work quite well since I'd leave to go home an hour before her. We didn't manage to meet ever after I left that school. Some weeks went by, for some reason we had got into a discussion. I don't remember why it started, but it happened. We both said stuff we shouldn't have said to each other, like saying crap about each other's insecurities or family problems. When we both stopped, we didn't talk for a week, but that was really bothering me. Not that we stopped talking, but because I felt bad for what I did to her, and I knew I shouldn't have, so I messaged her to apologize for what I did. I said something in the lines of, I feel bad for what I did to you. This last week, I was feeling awful, like there was some heavy weight on my shoulders. You might not trust me ever again after what I did to you, and I truly understand. I know that I should have never said all those things to you, and I'm really sorry. The fact that we might never go back to what we used to be really makes me feel sad. I just want you to forgive me for what I did. Some minutes went by, and she replied with, If you regret doing that, why did you do it? Might have some translation issues on that quote. And she then said some crap about crap me. I didn't say a word after that. Then she proceeded to block me literally everywhere. Hell, even on Twitter, which at the time I used just to post something once, that was it. Fast forward a couple years. After class, my classes were in the morning, like 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. My mom picked me up and said we'd go out for lunch that day. We got into the restaurant, got our food, and while we were eating, I was facing the entrance. And who decides to go by those doors? Anna and some of her friends. I didn't have feelings for her anymore, so I just saw it was her and turned back to my mom to continue what we were talking. Anna didn't notice it was me until she sat on a table right in front of me. Her reaction was priceless. She and some friends were laughing. When she looked in my direction and noticed it was me, her joy died in less than a second. That day, I was going to talk to her to see how life is and crap since she used to have some problems with her mom. But the way she reacted, I decided it was better not. 
After that, I only saw her on a friend's Instagram stories once. After we had our last conversation, I still had some feelings for her, and it was quite a pain in the butt because a lot of stuff I used to do was somehow a bit of her influence, like the music I'd hear, for example. I remember the good times we had every time I hear Runaway by Galantis playing, since she was the one who chose the song our class would dance at the end of the year. Nowadays, I still remember her music, but I don't feel the same way. I really wish that we'd meet someday just so we could get things sorted at least. She was a really good person, and I hope she still is. I think that about the fact that people fall in love with three people in life and how she was the first one. I know because I didn't know I was in love with her until years later. Honestly, a pretty touching story about young love. It's, you know, usually uh, pretty temporary. It doesn't stick around, but the feelings stick around with you. They're so powerful. Like, Love at that age is so all-encompassing in ways that I don't think you ever quite feel again. Not to say, like, my partner, Madam Fact, like, my love for her is incredible. I love her so, so much. But in high school, emotions just take you over, and that's rough. I don't know what you two said to each other, that she blocked you on everything and would never even think about forgiving you, but... The thing I, I've never got that whole like, hey, I'm, I'm so sorry that I did that. Well, if you're sorry, why did you do it in the first place? I don't know, because people make mistakes and can be dumb sometimes. It sucks, but it's a truth. I hope it wasn't that bad, and I hope you get that opportunity you talked about. Story two. I met him in high school. We stood next to each other in one of our choir classes, but maybe spoke to each other five times throughout the entire year. He was younger than me, but when I heard his voice, I was awed by his talent. But that's not what got me. We had two conversations that really impacted me. One over a song he was playing on the guitar before choir started, while everyone else was on the other side of the room. First time I really got to see what was behind the shy boy exterior, and I really liked it. More than a talented kid, he was passionate and well-spoken. Second conversation was me pushing him to audition for this really hard-to-get-into show choir because he was holding himself back despite wanting to join it. I knew he could do it, and from one conversation, I somehow convinced him to. He texted me when he got in. But then I graduated, and that was pretty much it, except for occasionally seeing each other's posts on Instagram. Although we started to occasionally talk on Instagram, not often, but we would check in on each other here and there. Fast forward to us both being fairly new young adults, and I think he was the one to hit me up first this time. I can't remember why, but we ended up talking for more than just a day or two. He wasn't the shy boy I met in high school. He was charming, charismatic, understanding, and extremely passionate. And he liked that I was passionate too, to the point he said, F it, what are you doing Friday? After two weeks of talking, we've been dating for nearly a year now, and I'm planning on moving with him to Boston because he got into Berklee College of Music. I mean, you know me. I'm a sucker for a story with a sweet, happy ending, and this one made me happy. This is wonderful. I'm glad that, you know, you two both grew. You had this connection, but, you know, you fostered this wonderful friendship first. And finally, after years of keeping that friendship and connection alive, you just went for it and things are working out. And I hope they continue working out. Story three. Well, there was this girl called Karen who I liked back when I was eight or nine years old. She was a dark haired girl with hair bangs and green eyes. I had a huge crush on her back then, and it turns out she had a crush on me too, but she left the school soon after, and we didn't see each other again until 2020. Anyways, many years passed, and I already had my girlfriend, now wife. So one day, I was in the store, and I bumped into Karen, and we both recognized each other, and we talked for a few minutes until I told her I had a girlfriend, which seemed to me like one. Her smile disappeared, and she just said, oh, and left. I didn't think much of it, and didn't think much of it, so I left after buying everything I needed, and that was it. Weeks later, she called me and asked me to get coffee or something to eat so that we could catch up. I accepted and met her at a restaurant, and we started to chat until she tried to kiss me. I gently pushed her back and told her I had a girlfriend, but of course she said that she wouldn't find out and tried kissing me again, and I just decided to pay and leave at this point. Karen followed me and told me that she still remembered me from all those years ago and still had feelings for me, but I told her that I had my girlfriend and I wasn't going to cheat on her, 
and asked Karen to not contact me again, got in my car, and left her there. Haven't seen her again since then. I don't regret my decision. I've known my wife since the age of 10, and we've been through hell and back together, and I would never cheat on her. Story 4. Still see her from time to time, and while I did have a small crush on her, it was more because she was the first female friend I had, since we knew each other as babies because our moms were best friends. We always saw each other doing New Year's and birthday parties, but we never hung out despite always going to the same school since kindergarten when high school happened. We saw each other less and less since we went to different schools, and whatever crush I had disappeared with time. Funny thing, however, is that my dad's birthday was just a month ago, and we actually sat down and talked about if our dating would have worked out, along with my little sister and her little brother talking about the same thing across from our table. All four of us realized that dating between our families would just feel awkward since we've known each other for so long. Our moms are practically sisters and our dads are as close as brothers without actually being blood related. Me and her agree that we saw each other more as brother and sister from different families or non-blood relatives and if we got together it would just be weird. Doesn't help that we have nothing in common and are only friends since we've known each other for so long. What are corporate secrets you can reveal? Viewers edition. Story 1. I worked at a family-owned restaurant that also had a bar and a separate building just 10 feet away. The place is in the middle of nowhere, but I was happy to have my first job as a cook in their restaurant. I was surprised at the amount of unsafe things they do because they rarely get checked by an inspector, but my god, the floors in the kitchen were so greasy I fell twi twice while working there, and the waitress fell several times in a month as well. So almost everyone stayed out of the kitchen except for me and the head cook. The head cook talked with a very hard to understand southern drawl, and I had just moved from New England to this southern state after graduating high school, so I was eager to try my best. He had more bad days than good days, quietly repeating angrily what he said, since I often didn't understand what he said, so as to not upset the people eating out in the restaurant. But he did teach me a lot, and I looked up to him as a teacher. The owner of the place was the dad of the family, but the mom ran the restaurant, and their son would often just show up for free food. Some nights, I would deliver hot wings from the restaurant to the bar, and one night I had to play waiter for the dad, as he had a game night with his friends in this secret room behind the bar. It was crazy, like a movie. They were sitting at a poker table with one light over it, a couple of girls were sitting on a couch in the corner smoking a joint while he and his friends smoked cigars talking about massive amounts of money they were gambling on this game. All the while, I'm in the corner waiting for what he wants me to do next. Eventually, one of the friends wins the first game, then they play a second, and one of the friends drops a small bag of weed on the table as his gamble. The dad wins the game and takes the money in the bag. They all get up to leave, and I begin cleaning the floor and resetting the chairs in the corner. The dad then heads over to the restaurant with me following behind with the dishes and gives the head cook the bag. The head cook stops me halfway through washing dishes and says, Follow me, gotta show you something. At this point I'm nervous because I didn't want to smoke anything, but kept the thought to myself and walked with him. He took a truckload of boxes we had cut up earlier around the back side of the bar and started a fire throwing in the boxes. Then he looked at me, held up the bag of weed, and threw it into the fire. He said, if you want a good job someday, you stay away from this crap. He then drove home in the truck. I quit that job a month later, worked at a Sonic for a while, then worked at a hospital kitchen for two years, got my first job in manufacturing, worked at that for three years, and became a team leader and rework specialist. Now I work a different job as an operator on a corrugated digital printer for a box company. I still think about that night, how if I continued working at that job, if eventually the owner would have been giving that bag to me, and what I would have been doing with it. I would have still been living with my parents. I would be driving the same crap box car. I would still be making $11 an hour. Crazy how just a few words can shape up a person's code of life. Look, I make no secret about the fact that I am very supportive of recreational use of uh, the electric cabbage. However, it's not something that you should be taking for payment from a boss, and that a boss should be, like, gambling on at their job and all that stuff. Like, that is not the place for that kind of stuff, and if your place of work is trying to do that, then, I mean, not great. So, 
good for you for getting out of there and finding yourself a, you know, much better job, all that kind of stuff. And uh, for the rest of you, pretty good lesson to learn. Story two. I was a manager at Petco, the CAL with a heavy focus on aquatics. Here's a little something for you. Because of how the systems are set up, the medications they use, and because of how their policies work for dealing with sick or infected fish, everything there is sick or carrying something. You'll never get a healthy fish from them unless you get there on delivery day and buy the vendor bag, and even that is iffy. There is no quarantining new arrivals. They go in with everything else, and you're only allowed to shut down a tank once an illness is noticeable in the tank. And by that time, the whole stack has it. You're only allowed to shut down individual tanks for treatment. Shutting down a whole stack requires regional approval. And good luck if you have a bunch of tanks shut down and they come on one of their visits. I always have tanks shut down and frequently shut down stacks because I'm not going to willingly screw over customers. Our saltwater section was never remotely healthy. One bad order from Seagrest, or the lack of any real medications to get rid of diseases, and that was it. I fought with those systems for years and never made any headway because I was totally hamstrung by company policy. The freshwater stuff isn't any better. If you're an aquatic husbandry enthusiast, you probably should already know this, but always have a quarantine tank at home. Quarantine, observe, and treat any new fish you buy for six weeks before putting them with your other fish. It saves a ton of headaches and money if you're buying more expensive fish. We also had the policy of railroading a problem employee instead of firing them in hopes of making them quit. I wouldn't participate in that because it's been done to me several times due to me being autistic. 100% about pet handling too. It's actually in the policy you're supposed to do that, but there is never time for it when you're chronically understaffed and don't have the hours to put towards it. FYI, gerbils and other such rodents make awful child pets. I know that's how they're seen, but those little bastards are ferocious and easily leave scars. Well, I guess I feel uh, somewhat better about the fact that I think the one that we go to is pet smart. Is that one better? God, I hope so. Probably not. Oh, man. Big chains being in charge of the lives of pets and animals. Ah, it hurts me. It hurts me deep down a little bit. So, hey, folks, whatever you do, take care of your pets and maybe avoid, uh, you know, this stuff. I don't even know how you do it in some places, but do your best. Story three. In my country, we have a very specific working rights, and I'm actually glad I don't work in the U.S. because we are heavily protected by the law here in Brazil. My first job was as an ESL, English Second Language teacher, in a private school. I was hired mainly because my mom had worked there as an ESL teacher there, and I graduated in ESL and got a Cambridge certificate there. No experience with teaching, and I was literally studying arts in college at that time. I had quite a great time. I loved my students, and I obviously wasn't a perfect teacher, but I saw my students evolve, and I got really proud. Every day, my boyfriend at the time, who was also a teacher at another school, would pick me up or wait with me until my mom picked me up so I wouldn't be alone. Once the semester was done, I was told my boyfriend could not wait with me anymore because it wasn't appropriate, even though I avoided physical contact because, duh, children are there, and I was poorly trained, with no training at all. From 24 students and about just 400 Brazilian real per month, they took my classes from me and gave me one with three students. I would earn, luckily, 200 Brazilian real per month. The manager, first time managing and little teaching experience, literally said to me, I just wasn't fired because she knew it was an issue with the training I had received. That absolutely broke me. I quit the same day, and when telling the story to my mom and boyfriend, both agreed it was a forced quit where they forced me to quit and lose all my working rights, get paid absolutely nothing for the unemployment, and get rid of me. Apparently, quite common in the teaching area here. My mom loved that school, and now all of us hate that place for forcing me to quit. Story 4 Former Walmart stalker here. A few secrets. 1. Fire exits were constantly blocked with merchandise and only emptied if an inspection was expected. Two, a lot of the older female cashiers, door greeters, and the like you saw for the longest time were women who hardly had a cent to their name who needed to work to support themselves. Some often worked until either they couldn't anymore due to advanced age or illness, 
or they simply died. Three, a significant number of younger female employees in the mid to late 2000s, to my discovery, were quite the wily ones. They could be highly perverted and or very touchy-feely. I've known at least two who were very eager, since they got to know me for one, to get belly rubs when they were pregnant. Three, social cliques among management and associates existed. They would cover each other's backs, but if you weren't in it, you couldn't get away with anything. Four, the facility that I worked at had a D-Day veteran as a door greeter. He did that job until he died because he believed it was the last thing he could do to serve his country. Rest in peace, Vince. You will be missed. Five, many females were passed up for promotion for whatever reason. Also, some female managers were known for risque behavior in the office behind closed doors and favoring male associates over other women. Story 5. Also, I can attest that the cameras at Target are certainly real, or used to be. When I was 15, my best friend and I would go in and steal CDs a few at a time. They didn't have those huge plastic things on them, just the cellophane, but a security tag inside the case. So we'd walk the store, go into an empty aisle, rip the wrapping off, take the CD out of the case, and put them in big pockets. Then hide the rest of the evidence behind a bunch of stuff. After a few weeks, I got clipped. I even got pretty severely manhandled by a guy much bigger than me, slammed me against the end cap of the aisle, and took me to the security room. He took his job very seriously and reviewed the video footage to see what we looked like, waited for us to come back, then watched the camera until we hit the CD aisle. Waited about two minutes, then came running across the store. I got taken into the security room where I saw all the screens, and he called the police. He turned out to be the husband of my favorite teacher from middle school, but that didn't help at all. He pressed charges on behalf of Target, and I was banned forever. I go back to Target plenty now, that was 18 years ago. Luckily, my neighbor was a preacher who knew some people and got rid of the charges for me. But yeah... The moral of the story is their cameras definitely worked great at one point. You know, yeah, I I've grew up hearing those rumors like, oh, you see like those like bulb things up there that are supposed to look like cameras. They're not even connected. They're just there to deter people. And I was always like, I think they might be connected because fun fact, cameras aren't that expensive <laughs> for like all the costs that, you know, Target or Walmart or whatever is pouring into the construction of their store some cheap old little security cameras that they got and like the storage space for them and stuff especially these days is it's a tiny fraction so yeah they work now how competent the people are who are watching those cameras i don't know the opposite genders mysteries revealed viewer edition story one I unfortunately have one of these stories, but more a not me, but my brother. I was around 17 or so, and my older brother hated how I was during my monthly rite of female suffering, because I'd be a short-tempered, cranky bee with a serious case of the munchies, the former and latter he'd unknowingly worsened by eating all the comfort-slash-junk food in the house, so I was cranky and hungry, and had nothing to sate the hunger which made me crankier. I wanted to skip the make food part and get right to the eat food part, and everything usually had some level of preparation needed beforehand, like even just making an effing sandwich was too much work. He also had a habit of eating in the kitchen. His go-to snack after he had eaten everything else was several slices of buttered toast, so he'd make two, butter, and eat them while waiting for the next two to pop up, and repeat until he was full, and didn't like sharing space so I would be cranky, hungry, and not have access to the kitchen to make food, nor be able to get a grab-and-go snack since he'd have eaten everything else. And he would get cranky because I was cranky, and it was basically just a spiral of anger because of anger. So one day he asked my mom if we could put me on birth control because he believed they would pretty much turn my periods off. After having a small laugh at him, my mother explained how birth control actually worked, and I didn't need it since my periods are clockwork levels of regulated, and the only thing that would turn my periods off was me going through menopause or if I had my uterus surgically removed. He stopped complaining about them after that, but that was the only thing that he stopped doing. It also meant that whenever I was angry, it was a, are you on your period? taunt. Sometimes I was, and would be like, yes, I am actually. Thank you for noticing. <sighs> Dear folks, 
If you're a human being who doesn't experience periods and you live with a human being who experiences pyramid periods, might I suggest that you try out this new little thing called empathy. Ah, empathy. Trying to maybe just understand what another human being is going through. Because for some folks, going through a period is fairly mild. But for others, it is an extremely painful, almost debilitating experience full of hormones and cramps and things that you don't understand. So just try and have a little empathy. Story two. To me, a lot of these aren't surprising, not because I already knew that the body could do this, but because we rarely get told things about the opposite sex's body until we're adults, where people have partners who don't mind sharing this information. If we never get told about these facts, how do they expect us to know? To me, I don't think not knowing this knowledge until you are older is embarrassing. I think it's normal, because how else would you know? I don't think I could go and ask some girl in my year at school all the technically obscure facts about their body. They might not even know yet about some of these things. I don't know, that's just how I see it. Anyway, I just don't think we should judge people for not knowing these facts until later on in life. Edit. I'm 12, by the way, so that's why I'm saying I can't just ask people in my class these facts. They are too immature slash embarrassed to tell me. I didn't know that I had viewers this young, and I... I Maybe shouldn't. I don't know. I'm not a good judge of these things. Uh, ask your parents. Um, what I will say is, I think part of the big problem of this is a lot of these things should be taught in like what is referred to as intercourse education, health classes, stuff like that. They should be explaining this stuff. They shouldn't leave it obscured. They shouldn't not tell guys about things like periods and stuff. We should know these facts about human beings. It's part of knowledge. It should be part of the knowledge base. And also, parents should be having these discussions with their kids. Let them know. Don't leave your kids wondering about stuff or confused about things until they're in their 20s. Story 3. Story 9 isn't wrong. It's a skill that takes a very strong pelvic floor, but on particularly heavy days will at most only buy you time. It's far from an average, more a niche skill that a unicorn level of women achieve. It takes a lot of practice, and again, even once achieved, isn't guaranteed to be 100% effective. My friend is pretty good at it, but she was also a state champion wrestler in boys wrestling and continued to keep her core and pelvic floor conditioned afterwards. Also, to be clear, it's not possible to hold it indefinitely to let out whenever you want to use the bathroom. It's just a practice of feeling the movement before it actually exits, tightening the muscles and being able to stop it from exiting until you get to a toilet. My friend has about 10 minutes to get to the bathroom before it beats her. 7 to 10 minutes. The only real bonus to this is saving money on sanitary products by not needing to use them when you're at home. Story 4. I used to work at a telemarketing company, and I was 19 to 21, and I worked with a lot of high schoolers, like 16 to 18, and every time I would get my period, I would always make it known because I have very, very painful periods. I have endometriosis and have ovarian cysts and have had several bursts. And I like to complain, and any time anyone would ask me what's wrong, I would just start with, well, once a month. And usually people stop me, but if they didn't, I would just keep talking about periods and explain literally everything to anyone who was close enough to be listening. And I educated so many teenage boys about periods and period products and literally as much as I could tell them in that shift. Like I once had like a two hour conversation with three teenage boys about what happens, pretty detailed recounts, and how to deal with a period and what they should do when their girlfriend or sister or any woman in their lives gets their period. Story 5. I'm a guy, so it may come as a surprise, but I didn't know what circumcision was until college, age 22. I knew it existed, I just didn't know what it was. I saw the A and B photos, but couldn't tell for the life of me which was before and after. One day a classmate showed me a video of a guy peeling a banana, but just the tip. I finally learned what foreskin was, and I learned that it's more of a peeling than a slicing, which for me is somehow more painful. It all clicked at once, and I started crying. Our professor looked at me and was confused. Once he explained what just happened, he responded, Really? Just now? Not upset, just genuinely surprised. 
I was honestly kept in the dark about this stuff too until I was like a teenager. I didn't realize that there were people who were not circumcised. Like that to me was just like, wait, what? Like eventually I saw a picture in like some health book in like junior high or high school. And I was like, wait, what? What the hell's going on? That does, that's not right. Story six. I must say that a lot of this is quite interesting to me, mainly because even if I'm a guy, I've been told countless times that I think similarly to a girl but act like a boy. That concept may sound a bit weird, but basically I have the general thought process that a lot of women have, though my actions reflect more that of a guy's impulse, and with this strange situation, half the time I don't understand where different unspoken rules come from with the opposite gender or my own. So it's been interesting for me to hear information like this from time to time, which to clarify, I'm mostly talking about the stuff revolving around general behavior, not any anatomy-based answers. Story 7. I'm a guy. When I was around 20, a 60-ish year old guy randomly asked why chickens laid eggs that hadn't been fertilized. That's actually a reasonable question. I went on to explain it by comparing it to human women having their period, which he interpreted as me saying women laid eggs. He said, I've been around a lot of women in my life and I can tell you women don't lay eggs. He laughed and literally refused to listen to the explanation then or in the future. To men or women who don't know, a menstrual cycle is your body getting rid of an unfertilized egg cell. Story 8. It's funny, because I grew up with two sisters and a mom who didn't find health-related talk of genitalia disgusting. I knew most of this growing up. Mom's a nurse, you kind of get used to gross stories. However, it took me an embarrassingly long time to learn I was circumcised as a baby. Most of my life, I could not figure out what a foreskin was. Story 9. I remember I had to educate my aunt that the pee hole and the baby hole were two different holes. I'm a boy. My intercourse ed class was actually super good because I know a lot about my junk and female junk as well, and I'm not ashamed or grossed out in any way. I don't usually get grossed out. I think it's important to know these things. Also, growing up with mostly girls in your house is good, I guess. My family only creates one man every generation, lol. I wish I had a brother, though. You know, honestly, this is a fairly common one that I've heard about, where there are women who do not know that about their own body, which, to be fair, it's not in, like, a easily examinable place. <laughs> and the fact that it's not being taught to them in, like, you know, intercourse education class is ridiculous. People should be getting taught this stuff, and their parents should be telling them these things. but. Yeah, I mean, if they're not, folks, guys, gals, non-binary pals, mirrors exist. Find out about your own body. You might learn something, but just, you know, keep it to yourself. Well, wait, keep it to yourself until you have kids and, you, you, and, and educate your kids. What's a fact, but nobody understands it correctly? Viewer edition. Story one. The Monty Hall problem sounds complicated, but it's not that complicated. There's three doors. Two have a goat, and one has a car behind it. You want the car. Host asks you to pick a door. Then they, they then open another door that has a goat behind it to reveal a goat. So there's two doors left. Your door and the other door, which isn't opened. One door has a car behind it. The host asks if you would like to switch doors. The question is, does switching doors have any difference, or is it just 50-50? The answer is, if you, the answer is, if you should switch doors, you'll have a two out of three chance of getting the car. It seems wrong. It doesn't make sense at first, but the explanation is below. When you first pick a door, you have a two out of three chance of picking a goat. So you've probably not got the car. Then the doors are reduced to two, one which has a car and one which does not. Now we've established that there's a two out of three chance you didn't pick the car, which means there's actually a two out of three chance that the other door you didn't pick has the car behind it. And so switching doors gives you a two out of three chance of getting the car. I can play it out below if that still doesn't make sense. So there's three doors called A, B, and C. Let's say door C has the car behind it. So you pick door A. 
the host reveals a goat behind door B. If you switch to door C, you win the car. If you pick door B, the host reveals the goat behind door A. If you switch to door C, you win the car. If you pick door C, the host reveals a goat behind either door A or door B. If you switch, you don't win the car. So two out of three times, you won the car by switching. Not switching only gives you a one out of three chance of winning the car. I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't convinced at the start of the explanation because I've heard this problem before and I'm like, I guess it makes sense in math, but it doesn't make sense logically, but... I don't know, for some reason, that explanation kind of convinced me. I'm, st I'm still not 100% sold. I still think that you mathematicians need to just chill out. <laughs> hey folks, did you not get the Monty Hall problem? Well, guess what? Story two! For those who don't know... The Monty Hall problem goes like this. You're on a game show and are presented with three doors. One of those doors has a brand new car behind it, while the other two have joke prizes. For example, goats! You're told to pick the door you think has the car behind it. After you pick one, however, the host reveals one of the remaining doors that has a goat behind it, and then asks you if you want to switch. The question is whether or not you should keep your original choice or switch. The correct answer is always better to switch at that point. I could get into the probability and math about why this is the case, but unfortunately that ends up confusing more people. A guy I know at work came up with a much better story to explain it. Ugh. Imagine God tells you, I'm thinking of a particular atom out of the 10 to the 78th power atoms in the observable universe. Try to pick the one I'm thinking of and I'll give you a billion dollars. So you pick one. Immediately, God brushes away all the other atoms in the universe beside the one you picked and one single other atom. And he says, one of the two is the atom he had in mind and asks you if you'd like to switch. Obviously, you definitely switch in that case because the odds are overwhelmingly, astronomically in favor of that atom being the one God had in mind. The same deal with Monty Hall, just with far lesser probability, but still greater than if you kept your original choice. If I just say that I get it, will people leave me alone in the comments? Please? <laughs> no, I actually, I, I, I understand the concept behind it. And actually that story that your friend made up takes it to such a wild scale that, yeah, you know what? I, I understand it now. That makes sense. I, I'm still iffy about the whole Monty Hall problem with the actual goats in a car, but you know what? Either way, the worst thing I'm walking out of there with is a goat, and you know, that's pretty cool. Story 3. I've actually got two. One, 20% chance of rain. Most people assume that when a weather forecaster says 20% chance of rain, that means that the day in question only has a 1 in 5 chance that there will be rain that day. But weather forecasts using some sort of bizarre counterintuitive moon logic aren't actually saying that. 20% chance of rain means that 20% of the area they're talking about at that time is definitely going to get rain. 2. The tomato is a fruit. True, botanically speaking, it is classified as a fruit, because the botanical usage of the word fruit is just shorthand for fruiting body, which is to say, the part of the plant that makes the seeds, spores, whatever, that will potentially grow into a new generation. However, the term vegetable has absolutely no scientific usage. It is a completely culinary agricultural term. Fruit means something completely different in terms of farming and cooking, and the tomato definitely doesn't meet the standards. It is a vegetable. So anyone who says that a tomato is X not Y, or uses an actually to imply that it's not the other thing, is objectively wrong. Anyone who says it's one, but doesn't bother to mention the other, is half correct. The only fully correct answer is, the tomato is a fruit and a vegetable. People always like to talk about, oh, tomato's actually a fruit or a vegetable or whatever. And yeah, I'm glad that this person got to the point that vegetable is more an agricultural culinary term. It's not scientific. But also, so many things are fruit. Cucumbers are fruit. Zucchini's fruit. Corn is a fruit. So many things that you call vegetables 
are fruiting bodies and therefore are technically fruit, just like a tomato. So all you little folks who like to be like, naturally a tomato is a... Shut up. Story four. I forget the source, but I remember reading somewhere that the reason for the 10% of our brains myth was from a news article where an interviewed scientist said something to the effect of, at present we only understand what about 10% of the brain actually does, which got misinterpreted over time by the article itself and by the general public via telegraph effect to mean there was 90% of the brain we as individuals didn't know how to use rather than that we used all of it, but scientists hadn't yet nailed down what all of the different parts actually did yet. Story 5. Concerning Story 28 from the original video, I've heard it explained as you don't use all of your brain at once any more than you have all of your house lights on at once. If they are all on at once, you're having a seizure. Even with the neurologist's clarification, this metaphor still makes a bit of sense given that most appliances still take some trickle charge when turned off. Concerning story 40 from the original video, there was a very recent, as in literally this past month, study that confirmed that cold temperatures kill off the immune cells in our nose, explaining why people are more likely to get sick in winter. It's not that the cold directly causes colds, but it makes cold germs more likely to get past your first line of defenses and actually infect you. Lack of vitamin D due to reduced sun exposure, vitamin D is a major player in the immune system, could also factor into this. So cold weather doesn't directly make you sick, but it does make getting sick more likely. Story 6 Concerning story 34 from the original video, for people who didn't spend their childhood watching syndicated reruns of old TV shows, most of this story refers to the original game show Let's Make a Deal from 1963, which was co-created and hosted by Monty Hall. The show is still around, but the most popular version was in the 60s and 70s. On the show, audience members would wear costumes and bring gimmicks to try to get attention. In addition to the games and prizes, the show featured music and comedy bits. It was basically a variety show with audience members providing the entertainment. Concerning Story 36, also, so many women died during childbirth, 20-30% to 30%, that the average male lifespan was significantly longer than female. Story 7 as far as I understand, it's more complicated for the last one. You may experience symptoms of the common cold for lots of reasons. It's not always viruses. And minor hypothermia also may be in charge. It's usually short-term in this case, though. Also, it arguably may slightly decrease your immune response, which may be enough to catch a virus if you have already encountered it. Other sources say you're less likely to get common cold if your immune system is weaker, though. But hypothermia isn't going to give you rhinovirus or whatever else upper respiratory tract infection. Yeah, I feel like even when I was a kid, it was pretty well known that the whole like, oh, if you go outside when it's cold, then you're going to get a cold. No, we, we knew even back then, all those decades ago, that that was not true. And it's just, yeah, it makes you weaker. And also, I think they say, like, when people are cold, they tend to, like, huddle together a little bit more, so you're in closer contact. There are so many things where it being cold can lead to greater chances of getting sick, but it's not a direct connection. Story 8. The scenario of the Lucy movie was a terrible through and through. Example, towards the end, she can snap her fingers and make a room full of people pass out. Despite this, for tension building, the scenarist went for Group of good guys, please sacrifice yourself to hold the incoming enemies off while I go do something. In the time she asked, she could have taken care of the threat herself. What did you have to unlearn from your parents? Viewer edition. Story 1. For me, it was the whole love thing. I mean, when they gave me advice on romantic relationships, it was actually mostly great advice. However, when it came to friendships and familial love, it was a wreck. First, because they only addressed rarely, and when they did, it was utter, very toxic stuff. To make a long story short, telling a kid that she shouldn't get attached too much to her best friend because if the city flooded, that friend would pick to save her sister over her, aka me, 
which is technically correct, but a pretty messed up thing to tell a kid. And there's, of course, the fact that kids learn by emulating their parents' behavior. So I internalized and normalized all sorts of toxic ideas about love. So I turned very emotionally dependent, and with tons of separation anxiety and fear of abandonment while growing up, I had no idea how to establish normal, healthy friendships. I also came to not care about my extended family in the slightest. My relationship with my nuclear family is also very broken. For years, I tried to justify their whole, now I love you, now I don't thing. So by the time I got myself a girlfriend and friends who could understand my situation better, it was really a shock for me to learn that love isn't conditional and that rather than a scorching flame, love of any kind is more like a slow burning fire. Love is meant to give you stability and comfort, not to keep you on the verge of a panic attack. Of course, romantic love has passion added in the mix, but that's the thing. Passion and intensity is there to spice it up, not to completely overtake the meal, so to speak. Oof. Yeah, there's, uh, I think a lot of people have a lot of, you know, wrong ideas about different kinds of love, and I'm no expert on this stuff, but, uh, Really what the OP is saying here is pretty solid advice that I think a lot of folks could learn from. So, yeah, uh, listen to them. <laughs> Story 2. My parents taught me to come to a rolling stop at stop signs. For those who don't know, a rolling stop is where you slow down but don't come to a complete stop at a stop sign. The way you can tell you came to a complete stop is when you feel the car jerk back slightly. Then wait for a couple seconds, then go. I flunked my first go at my driver's test with the DMV, with that being one of the major factors as to why. Ever since then, I would come to a complete stop at every stop sign, even if other drivers behind me got mad. Although in all my years of driving, I haven't seen that. However, there are some times when you do need to do a rolling stop. Myself and many other motorists just has to deal with that yesterday, in fact, when we were hit by a snowstorm that dumped eight inches of snow on us. The roads were covered, so in order to maintain traction, we'd have to come to a rolling stop instead of a complete one. But in most cases, just come to a complete stop. You'll avoid getting in trouble with the law that way. Look, if we want to start going over all the ways in which people don't obey the rules of the road and just do whatever's close to the law, that's going to be the whole video, honestly. Um, the roads are a wild place. But yeah, I would say this is a pretty important one. Just getting used to fully stopping. Uh, just do it. It's, it's going to cost you, what, an extra second or two? Are you really that busy? Story 3. Concerning Story 5 from the original video, about the abuse going on in another apartment but grandma and family refusing to interfere, well done to the OP for breaking the mold in this situation and anyone else that faces their own fears to help someone else. This is a perfect example of the bystander effect, a social psychological theory that describes how in a situation where there are a number of witnesses, it's well documented that people choose not to interfere in the hope slash assumption that someone else will. The more witnesses there are, the less likely it will end up reported at all. I think this is more likely to occur when the event witnessed is socially uncomfortable. If it's something like a car accident, then I think people would have less issue reporting it. I think upbringing will have an impact too. I hope OP and anyone reading this can check their own behavior and teach their own families that it is okay to call for help for other people if they're concerned about them. It's not grassing on someone. Any interference is done out of compassion and concern rather than mean-spirited. And it's so important to act because they might be the only person that will. They could save a life by stepping up. Story 4. Not really taught, but I'm 18, about to be 19 in the next few weeks, and my mom had several poor relationships, like two. One with my father, which ended with them splitting and me having a divided family and home. Second one was with a man who emotionally hurt her, but actually hurt her physically a few times. After standing up to this six foot three burly dude at age 13, my mom would always turn to me for help. So much so, I was literally giving relationship advice despite never being in one at that point. Eventually it dawned on me that what my mom is doing does the exact opposite. I eventually got to the point where I started falling into the toxic masculinity slip of not opening up even when asked. 
Eventually one day I just broke down sobbing. My girlfriend quickly got worried about me and I just let the dam go. It all crumbled apart and everything came out. How I always wanted a nuclear family, not a split one. Always wanted a happy home that wasn't mentally and emotionally hurtful. The one positive was my relationship that I made sure worked. It's been over one year for me and my girlfriend and we have beautiful plans for Valentine's Day. Story 5 not me, but my husband, and it is something he is still unlearning. He did not have the greatest of upbringing, and his parents were always begging and blaming for things and not receiving help. They haven't received help because they have asked for so much and haven't paid back. My husband saw this, and in his mind, he has to be independent to avoid being in the same situation. When we've asked his parents for help, even for the smallest of things, like watching our daughter for a few hours, they make a big deal out of it. It's upsetting because he's surprised that my biological and stepfamilies have offered or even asked what we need because they know what kind of situation we're currently in. Yeah, in the next month or so, we're moving to ID and be a state away from his parents. They give me anxiety and it boggles my mind how they have certain habits and yet crab about being complained to about said habits. I think there are a lot of parents out there that struggle with dealing with teaching their child like how much self-sufficiency and how much asking for help is okay. And obviously some parents are gonna have their own messed up ideas about, you know, how much of either you're supposed to do. But like, I know uh, with my dad and stepmom, they really tried to teach me to be self-sufficient. And in some of my early days when I made some mistakes, they basically left me like, hey, well, you're gonna have to figure it out. You screwed up. And I did eventually learn my ways, but not, a, not before I screwed up a lot. I ruined my finances, I dropped out of college, all this stuff, because I didn't feel like I could go to them for help after that. And that's not on them. They've done so much good stuff, great parents in so many ways, but I look at that and go, yeah, I had a really hard time for so many years asking for help because of the way they treated that. And I'm glad that I'm not like that anymore. Story 6. I'm learning to not make excuses and to not judge people so much. It's quite hard. My mother never pushed me in school or parented me, really, and always made excuses when I didn't study enough or forgot about homework and would get mad at myself. Over time, I began to make excuses for everything, which is a horrible habit. I understand that she was doing it out of love, but still wasn't great. As for the second one, she most definitely inherited judging people constantly from her narc mother and judgmental as F family. I love them, but wow, they can be judgmental and care heavily about their looks. I honestly don't get why she's like that, seeing as she went from wealthy family to disability with a slob as a husband, which they still judge her for. At this point, though, I'll always be judged because of my scars, piercings, and gothic clothing, so I try to focus on myself. Story 7 as someone who was abused heavily by a narcissistic mother and almost lost my sister due to her abuse, I had to unlearn the idea that every family was broken and that we had to keep all the brokenness to ourselves. It wasn't until I was 16 and nearly lost my sister due to self-termination attempts that my mother never cared about and called her overdramatic, I knew that enough was enough and did everything in my power to get help. My mom has since died due to cancer, and my sister has gotten so much better and has unlearned many tendencies we developed from being raised by her. But to this day, my sister says that she wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for me, and my dad to this day keeps trying to make it up to both of us for being so wrong. Story 8 My mother put me in foster care as a teenager, so I unlearned everything pretty quickly since telling them how you're feeling will eventually almost immediately be used against you. LeVay was my role model for the longest time until I was punished for believing his ideals. Then I just became emotionless and quiet, and then they tried diagnosing me with being a psychopath, which in reality I just didn't tell them anything and didn't show any emotion because everything I said and did, whether publicly or privately, was going to be used in some way to punish me. Group homes suck. They claim they're helping the mentally handicapped, but they're just using us for a paycheck and very often a punching bag. The best thing you've seen a gang do, viewer edition. Story one. My mom's brother David was in a motorcycle club and I've got two stories related to him. Many years ago, he had to veer off the road to avoid a collision with a sedan that cut him off. He suffered a major laceration to his thigh that was bleeding severely, but managed to crawl to a payphone to call 911 for an ambulance. 
This was impressive because he was mobility impaired due to lifelong complications from polio as well as the leg injury. The hospital he was at was running out of blood, and they were going to lose him if they couldn't get more, because the tear in his femoral artery was just that severe. My mother drove to his motorcycle club's house and told them all what was going on, and she was almost done telling them the hospital needed blood by the time they were all astride their bikes and roaring toward the hospital in formation. At the hospital, there was an entire row of big, burly biker guys giving their absolute maximum limit of blood, even getting in arguments with the staff about wanting to give more despite it being unsafe to give too much at once. Because of the blood the hospital now had, they managed to save David after 21 pints of blood had gone through him from the torn femoral artery. The second story is shorter and bittersweet. David passed away in an incident while trying to refill a propane tank to, unbeknownst to anyone at the time, had a faulty valve. The tank's valve exploded with enough force to throw him against the wall of his workshop slash shed hard enough to cause significant bleeding in his brain, and there was nothing to be done to save him. Come the day of his funeral, and multiple motorcycle clubs across the state and region had come to pay their respects. David had been a longtime advocate of helmet wearing and safety gear while riding, and some riders had stories to tell at his funeral about how his advocacy for wearing their helmet literally saved their life on at least one occasion. A lot of motorcycle clubs are really loyal not just to one another, but their community. Um, for the most part, motorcycle clubs, they're not like ruffians and people who are going to do bad stuff to you. They are there, you know, because they love to bike together and, you know, they like the camaraderie and oftentimes, as I said, their community and they'll do anything to help out and keep people safe. And sometimes that means, you know, not obeying the rules, but I don't know if you're not obeying the rules for the betterment of your community. Uh, you know, uh, decide whatever you think about that. Story two. A few years ago, there was a kidnapping in my area, and it was a big local news. The same day the kid's description was given, I went out on my bike to check the common areas near my place and actually saw the kid locked in a car. I asked a nearby guy in a motorbike for help and explained the situation. Lo and behold, he got an entire biker gang out, surrounded the car with their motorcycles, and then some of them freed the kid and brought him to me. And as this was happening, I also called the police at the same time as the bikers were freeing him. Then then the kidnapper came back, shouting and threatening with a knife, and the bikers pinned him down with ease until the police arrived, and after the whole ordeal was discussed with the police, the biker whom I first asked ended up taking the kid home on his bike with a police biker as an escort, of course. Edit. To the kid's home, obviously, and don't forget that a police with motorbike followed to ensure the kid's safety. Honestly, without the bikers helping, the police would have arrived after the kidnapper already left. And on my own, I would have been rather defenseless against him and his knife, too. See what I mean? You don't mess with the people in the motorcycle club, and you sure as heck don't mess with their community. And kids. A lot of motorcycle clubs are very big on protecting kids, and that's wonderful. So, yeah, I say good on them for taking these things into their own hands. Hey folks, just a quick content warning for this next story. It does have some reference to some attempted uh, S assault, so if you are uncomfortable with that, just skip to the times code that the editor has put on screen to get to the next story. Story 3 I have a local biker gang in my area. I've known most of the people in it since I was little because my dad used to ride and fix motorcycles. Well, one day there was a car slash bike show that I went to with my dad, brother, best friend, and at the time, boyfriend. Well, my boyfriend at the time met the bikers and they told him if he ever hurt me, they would hurt him. Unluckily for my ex, they were serious. I found out my ex was cheating on me and he took me out to dinner to talk. Well, that turned to him trying to force himself upon me. We were in a very hidden area of the restaurant. He covered my mouth and punched me in the face twice, which broke my nose, gave me a black eye, and busted my lip, then held me down. Well, this booth happened to be near the men's bathroom, and as I'm trying to claw my way out of his grasp, I hear, I told you we'd hurt you, boy. And the ex got ripped off me and dragged outside by three of the guys. 
They dragged him out so as not to disturb other people eating and beat him to a pulp, then came back in to check on me and get some ice. They went back outside, gave him some ice, and told him to F off or they'd beat him till he was unrecognizable. Then they called my parents and took me to the doctor on the back of their bike. Story 4. While I was on a mission for my church, I spoke to some other missionaries about an interesting event that happened to them. They lived and worked in a not-so-nice part of town. Violence was everyday practice. They stepped outside their door and two gang members were standing outside. The gang members told them, You guys aren't doing anything today. Go inside. They, of course, just chuckled and explained that it's basically their job to go out and spread the good word. The gang members replied with, Stuff is going down today and we're going to make sure it doesn't get to you. The missionaries relented and went back inside and told their boss, best term for it, who was frustrated at first, but after they explained it, he understood. Always surprised how God-fearing, even though they may not be churchgoers, gang members can be. Story 5. Just a funny twist. I was garage sailing the other day and came up to a house where two big biker guys had stuff laid out on the driveway. I was the only one there besides them at the time. I looked through the stuff, left, and came back with actually wanting something. I bought a used coat, which was a black and gray striped winter coat with an awesome flying faded skull all over it, and a biker helmet I decorated for Halloween. They even warned me when I was going through a box of stuff in the garage that was also available that better not look through there. There are some shows only for adults. Wasn't threatening, just letting me know what they were. I paid the guys and left on my bicycle. When I told my parents I went to a garage sale of bikers, days later in a car at a parking lot, Dan warned me to be very careful about bikers and should be with them. Then, of course, he asked me where I got my cool coat. I told him I got it from those bikers. I still wear that coat to this day. I mean, you should be as careful with bikers as you should with, you know, any people that you don't know, strangers and stuff like that. But honestly, when it comes to biker gangs and motorcycle clubs, as long as you're pretty respectful and stuff, for the most part, they're pretty cool people. I've known many people in motorcycle clubs, and they're just a lot of nice folks. Not to say that they all are. Like I said, any strangers... Use some caution and some common sense. Story 6. This is a story a history teacher of mine told the class. He used to teach English in Japan and played in a jazz band as well. At the high school, there was one class that was extremely disrespectful and didn't behave for any teacher. Anyway, one night after a gig, my teacher wanted to get a drink and went looking for a bar. He came across one that seemed to be closed, but he could hear voices inside and decided to check it out. When he entered, the men there, who were Yakuza, looked at him for a moment before one of them came up to meet him. Eventually, they welcomed him in and got talking where my teacher mentioned that he worked at the high school in town. The next day he went to work, the misbehaving class, for whatever reason, were respectful when he was teaching. Later, my teacher found out that class primarily had the kids of those Yakuza members he had met, and they were told to behave in his class. Story 7. I remember the story of a bikey gang clubhouse in a residential area. Two houses down, an elderly lady lived. As they were raised to respect their elders, they did handyman stuff for her. Mowed her lawns, fixed things around the house, that sort of thing. In return, she cooked them cakes and biscuits. One evening, a lowlife thought this was a good place to do a home invasion. The bikies heard her scream and four of them jumped the fence. One made her a cup of tea, one stood with her to make sure she was okay, another called the cops, and finally the last one had grabbed this thug, frog-marched him outside, and threw him to the ground. With a knee to the thug's back, he was warned, you move, you die. When the cops arrived, they shook hand with the bikies, thanked them for the easy arrest, and left. Story 8. Back in the 90s, my grandma lived in a small town full of gossip near the border. The hells were very present. Nearly no crimes committed, but it was their territory. People feared them. My grandma was at the hair salon. The hell's angels parked in front of it to head to the bar next to it. My grandmother had to zigzag through the bikes to get out and was sweating bullets the entire time. The gang saw her, and they all clapped when she succeeded. She didn't really want to scratch the bikes. Now the hells will swerve out of the way and form two columns to let her pass. The gossip was real fire this year. The kind lady from the suburbs got the Hells Angels to respect her. Boy, it was interesting to hear those stories. 
I was really hoping that this was going to be the story of how your grandma joined the Hells Angels or something. Like, what an amazing story that would be. This is still a great story and put a huge smile on my face, but come on, folks. I need the story of, like, an old lady who was just so sweet to bikers that she, like, became one of the bikers and got a roar and hog and everything. I want to think of, like, a little 90-year-old lady riding around with some, like, handlebars up here just like, yeah! <laughs> Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.